Good morning. Happy um, Palm Sunday. If you don't know what that means, you will by the finish of today. Um, it's just great to be here. Very kind of Stephen Wendy to invite me and uh, share with you. Um, you know, I usually like to talk about stuff that just encourages people in your life, but today. I'm not going to discourage you, but I, I do want to share with you some history that helps us kind of locate what God's done in the past and maybe get some sense of what he's going to do. Because um, how many know that God lives above time? He's, you know, he's the Bible calls him Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's already at the end, so he can look back from there, and he's he was there at the start, so he could, and he was able to see the end from the beginning. It's kind of like a, you know, those incredible chess players that will. Not geniuses would make the silly move that they forgot they already worked out not to do. But God has seen every single move even before it's done. And in the middle of that, he gave us free will. I mean, I don't know how he can do that, but somehow God, he knows people's hearts. He knows what we're thinking. He knows why we do what we do. And before we even made a mess of this planet, he already figured out the solution. He decided to send Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners. God knew that we would make a mess of things. Um, human beings collectively and as individuals that we'd make mistakes that we would need help from heaven we would need divine help so he sent Jesus Jesus broke into the human experience around 2,000 years ago it was a strategic time um, because God's a God of strategy and Jesus came right on time in fact the, the the people of faith before he came were looking forward to Messiah coming who would take care of their sin take care of their failure and now we since Jesus came look back at what he did remembering that he's already paid for our failures so we don't have to live in shame anymore we don't have to live in defeat we don't have to live uh, without hope without purpose because Jesus has already solved the problem he beat the devil up. He took the keys of hell and death. He triumphed over all of hell. He's already defeated death. I mean, the worst enemy you can face is dying. And yet Jesus goes, I've been there, done that, taken care of it. Just hang with me and you'll be fine. Even crossing that threshold into the next life, he goes, I've got it all sorted. You're coming with me. So, you know, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to be anxious about when your life's in the care of Jesus Christ. God, even though he's chosen to remain invisible, and he obviously has chosen to remain invisible because you can't see him with your natural eye, he didn't want to be unknown. You understand? I think one of the reasons God remains invisible is because he wants us to come for him because we want him. We're hungry, we're thirsty. If he was constantly there on display with full, full power, glory, shining like the brilliance of a million suns, you wouldn't feel like you had a choice. But the very fact that God's all around us, but you can't see him with this eye. You can see him with your spirit, man, because we're supposed to look on Jesus, behold his glory, and be transformed by that. So your inner man can see him, but your, your natural man can't. So that's the way it is, and that's the way it'll be until he comes back. And then we'll all get to see him shining like the sun, as the lightning shines from the east to the west. So we're going to cover some of that territory. Jesus, when he first came, and when he comes again, because he's promised to return. So, um, you know, I mean, actually this year, I guess I haven't talked to you guys this year, it was an interesting year prophetically, if, if you're interested in, in prophecy. But it's interesting that exactly 500 years ago, this year, on October the 31st, Martin Luther is the guy that started what's called the Reformation. Wow. So that was exactly 500 years, which is, if you know the Bible, groups of 50 years are really important. Because God worked through a system of 50 years where the 50th year was called a year of Jubilee and he would wipe out everybody's debt. So, you know, if you had a bank card, you get it, get it wiped out by God. 
on that year. So, you know, people would try and spend big, not really. Eh? <laughs> but, but it was his way of just putting some structure around people's time that it kind of encompassed most people in their lifetime would experience a jubilee. Whether, whether they're younger or whether they're older. And 50 years is very important. A lot of things were timed by that. So when you go 10 jubilees, 10 lots of 50, since the Reformation, that changed the whole world. When the Reformation came, what happened? It was Martin Luther, and he, he, he nailed some, you know, a written document on a church door. It was, you know, they were his theses. And what it was, was... The prevailing religious belief of the day was came from the Roman church and they, they made people pay money to get their dead relatives out of hell or purgatory. And it's a belief that's not even in the Bible, but they used it to raise money and they'd make people give them their gold, their, their wealth, their jewellery, anything of value, they'd say, you've got to give, it, give that to the church because we, we're going to... You know, we know as the priests that your dead relatives are in terrible pain and you've got to pay us money to get them out. I mean, a dreadful doctrine. It was wicked and it's totally not Bible at all, not anywhere near it. Evil, because Jesus paid for us to go to heaven and get out of hell free, so you can't add anything to that. And it was a wicked thing. So, so Luther, he just goes, hang on a second. And by the way, at the time, they were saying, you can't personally approach God. Because God, you know, he, you've got to go through someone more holy, who's the priest. Well, that's a dreadful teaching too. That's not in the Bible. Yeah. And he, he stood up and said, hang on a second. The Bible says the just uh, live by faith. In other words... Each individual person can come straight before God just by faith. You don't have to perform for it. You don't have to do rites or rituals. You know, you don't have to run beads or whatever they do. You don't have to make confessions in a booth. You don't have to do all the religious rigmarole. Jesus paid for every single person to march straight in boldly before the throne of grace and there to find favor, mercy, and, and the kindness of God. God wants you to come and sit on his lap, to talk to him personally, one-on-one. -on -one. There's no one more holy than you when Jesus lives in you. So this whole thing of hierarchies, of, of some people are really spiritual and talk to God, and the rest of us are plebs. Well, it's just not true. That's not in the Bible. That's not what Jesus came to do. He came to put us on incredibly high standing that we had access to God because our sins are the only thing that separates people from God is sin when sins taken away you have total access yeah, that's right. nothing to be ashamed of it's clean you're clean Amen. Yeah. so that ref, that's what the reformation was about it was changing those major the major mindsets and it changed the entire world out of that came um you know, incredible creativity. Um, you know, the whole renaissance came out of that. Art, music, classical music. I mean, so many incredible things changed in the world because people's belief changed and they stopped living oppressed by a system that was wicked. Are you with me? So it was a very important time. The whole world changed 500 years ago. This year, anniversary, end of... It's amazing. And do you realise that exactly... Two jubilees ago, which is a hundred years this year, a bunch of Aussies and Kiwis and a few Poms got on their horses and rode from Egypt into what today is Israel yeah. to right. regain the land from the Turkish Ottoman Empire, who were the Muslim Turkish Ottoman. They had lived there for 400, controlled it for four or 600 years. And the Aussies and, and Kiwis, the Anzacs, got it back off them, liberated it. That's the light horse and the charge of the light horse brigade. And from that point, it was possible for the Jews to return to a homeland. Prior, and this is something Jesus had said would always happen. The Jews would be scattered. He prophesied it. He said, listen, you better watch out. When armies come in, they're going to invade Jerusalem. And you who listen to me need to run for your lives. Get out of there. And you're going to be scattered throughout the earth for a time. He made it very clear. 
Do you know the, the historian Josephus tells us that the Christians particularly did exactly that. They, their lives were saved by the fact they listened to what Jesus warned was going to happen because, you know, within 40 years, in 70 AD, Titus, the general, the Roman general, invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. In fact, they, they burnt it and all the gold paneling uh, that was all over, the, it was very much gold gilded. The, the gold melted down into the cracks, so they turned all the stones up to try and get the gold in the cracks. And exactly what Jesus said would happen, not one stone was left standing on the other. And it was one of the most magnificent buildings of the day. So Jesus was right that that would happen and the Jews were scattered. But he also forecast a time when they would have their land back, Jerusalem back, and that they would have a, a temple rebuilt. Well, that was never going to happen until they got their land. They lost their land for nearly 2,000 years. Incredible that the Jews remained a people. I mean, we're Aussies. You know, I bet in this room you've got probably at least 10 to 20 different nationalities here. And yet, basically within two or three generations, you know, whether you're Italian, Greek, Pommy, South African, you know, indigenous. I mean, indigenous maybe more you hang on to your identity with that. But, but most of us, we've just blended in. We're, we're Aussies. You know, and you let it go. But the Jews stayed who they were. That's a supernatural sign to the planet. God preserved them. The enemy tried to wipe them out in the Holocaust. But God, just, he, he, he preserved enough so that they could start their nation. And a and hundred years ago, that became possible. There was also a declaration signed a hundred years ago called the Balfour Declaration that said that they wanted to give that piece of land back to the Jewish people. That happened a hundred years ago. Do you know exactly 50 years ago this year, one Jubilee, the Jews got Jerusalem back. See, they didn't really have their land without Jerusalem because Jerusalem's called the city of the great king. It's, their, it's, their, it's, their, um, it's the heart city of the nation, if you like. Without the, without the heart city, they, they don't really have the whole nation. Do you know how they got it? Was, it? was it the surrounding Arabic Muslim nations wanted to take everything off them and the Jews were willing to surrender most of it but the Arabs wouldn't even accept that. So they invaded, like every nation around them invaded this tiny little nation. And when they fought back, God helped them. And they actually got territory they'd never even had before, which included Jerusalem. It shows you that when God's with you, he's going to help you take territory that's more than what you probably already have. He's able to advance you. He's able to give you victory. He's able to cause you to triumph in life and go where you could probably never get to in your own strength. Sometimes he allows opposition, like they experience, to, to, to actually take you further. So if you're sitting here this morning, you're thinking, my goodness, why am I going through all of this trouble? You know, it just might be that it's like God just pulling back the bow, you know, the string on the bow. It, it, the tension's increasing only so he can fire the arrow and sh send you further than you could get any other way. That's been my experience. So you go through that, but, but, but prophetically, it's very important. This year, we don't know why, we don't know what's going to happen, although what happened this last week makes you wonder. Because suddenly, because, because of these, these, these um, bombs that were dropped in Syria, first time that America has, you know, played its, played its cards, put its hand out to say whose side they're on. Because they were talking about getting on with Russia, but all of a sudden now, Russia, Iran, Syria, all of those countries, they're dead against what the US is doing because US is there supporting Israel. So I'm just saying you never know what could happen. But this year, something could very much happen in the, in the, in the scheduling of God. You know, when I say that, some, some dreadful things have happened in history. Some terrible things. Some, like the, the plagues that wiped out millions of people, the, the, the wars. That, and, and so don't ever think that I'm saying God intended that to happen. You know, he simply knows what man's going to do. See, man is in a lot of trouble, mainly because we said we're doing it our own way, God. Yeah. You know, that's the very start of the fall in the Garden of Eden. The problem started when they just said, 
on earth where you can be as your own God. You don't have to, you don't have to do it his way, you can do it my way. And the, and the reason that we're in trouble today is because man reckons he can do it better than God's way. He's just running full steam ahead. I'll fix it. I'll sort it. I'll make life what I want it to be. And it's only going to get uglier and messier until we're humbled enough to come back and do it God's way. And maybe it's got to get worse before it can get better. I'm just saying. It tends to have been the way that it's happened over history. But anyway, this could be an interesting year. But, but, but today particularly is a day that we call Palm Sunday. Does anyone know why we call it Palm Sunday? Yeah. Yeah. You can put the first slide up if you like. You know, because of what? Because Jesus came marching into Jerusalem. On this day, probably 32 AD, and as he came, they, they pulled palm fronds off the palms and began waving them, a bit like our friend was waving the flags back up there today, a way of saying, we recognize you as Messiah, yeah, as the Son of God, as the Savior of the world. So this is what it says, that the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He just stayed the night before over the Mount of Olives with his friends Lazarus, Mary and Martha. And they'd, she did, uh, Mary had anointed him with oil for his burial. Anyway, so he comes, he's coming down at Sunday. He couldn't come on Saturday because it's a Sabbath day. He wasn't allowed to travel then. The Sabbath said you've always got to just stay within a certain, you know, you can't travel because you're meant to rest. It's a Sabbath day. So... It says, they took branches, went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. I mean, there are crowds out there. They're shouting, they're yelling, they're, they're, they're so happy because they recognize this is the promised Messiah. Are you with me? And it says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So 600 years before, Zechariah the prophet had said, this is how you're going to recognize your king. He's not going to come as a Roman type general or a king with a crown, as a big bully barging in telling everybody to bow. He, he's going to come in humble on a donkey and people are going to worship him. You know why they worshipped him? Gratitude. Because for the last two or three years, he's been healing the sick, miraculously healing and helping people. And they've, they've just realised this guy loves us. He's here for us to help us. And they wanted him as their king because they knew he had their best interests at heart. So here he is, they're worshipping him. And the, the only thing is that not everybody liked him coming. Not everybody wanted him to, to march into Jerusalem triumphant. And it, says, um, and it says about this that the Pharisees didn't like it. Can we go to the next frame? And the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Like, tell them to stop praising you. And I'll tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You know what that means? Is that all creation was aware of who he was, yeah. but some of the people weren't. Yeah. When we were there, Steve, we should have picked up some of those rocks. Yeah, we, should have. we should have brought them home. We could be saying, this is my rock that was going to sing but didn't have to because everybody else did. Yeah, that's right. You know? But we were, we were, we, you know, it's amazing when you're there, you realize this is actually where Jesus came down the Mount of Olives. He's looking down on Jerusalem and he's, he's going there because his father's house, the temple, is, is in the city. So he goes down to the city and on, this is the day we're celebrating. The crowds have been praising him, but he wants to know what's happening in his father's house. So he goes down there, and what does he find? But they're making money out of the sacrifices. They're selling pigeons, they're selling lambs, they're selling stuff. It's all about the merchandise, 
profiteering. And this is the third time in a row. So Jesus makes a whip and he starts whacking the animals and, you know, karate kicking the money changers tables, knocking them over. And he's making a massive ruckus. I mean, he's a stirrer. And he's going, you guys, you have turned my, my father's house is meant to be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a house of business. And he was so upset. So he realized that even though there were, there, there were those on the outside that embraced him, perhaps only superficially, at the core, at the heart of the nation, there was no change. They were not interested in him. They were not interested in putting God first, prayer first, worship first, honouring God first. They were still self-interested. We're making money out of this. We're going to get ourselves rich and we don't care how we do it. We don't care who we've got to exploit to get what we want for us. They were the leadership. And, and we, we understand if you read the Gospels that they were actually very, very nervous about Jesus. They were jealous of him. They were worried that he was getting the crowd's attention and they didn't like it because they wanted the attention. They enjoyed being the bosses of the place, of being the spiritual heavies, of being able to tell people what they can and can't do. And so he... They were threatened by him, and that's why they wanted to get rid of him. That's why they wanted him dead, because of jealousy, because he, he, he had the real thing, and all they had was a hollow shell. They were fake. Jesus called The people Jesus got most mad at weren't the adulterers. They weren't the thieves, weren't, weren't, weren't the real rat bags. The people he most got mad at were these religious, self-righteous hypocrites who made themselves look more important than they really were. And, 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 and he said to them, he said, listen, you're putting heavy burdens on people that you don't even want to carry yourself. And that's what he was most mad about. I believe he loved them, but he was mad about what they were doing and how they were operating. And so on this very day that we're celebrating was called the, 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 the calendar date in Jewish terms was called Nisan the 10th. Nisan is the first month on the Jewish calendar. And on the 10th day of Nisan, that's the day that the priests would go to Bethlehem to pick out the unblemished lamb getting ready for what's the Passover celebration. So the priests on this Sunday that Jesus comes marching in to Jerusalem, they are out picking a lamb to sacrifice as the perfect unblemished lamb and they're going to sacrifice it on Nisan the 14th. Well here on that same day, God is presenting to them his unblemished lamb and saying, I'm providing the perfect sacrifice Animals can't really take your sin away, but the innocent Son of God, He's going to carry the sins of the world in the same way that the Lamb was representative. And He's presenting Him on the very day. On the very day that they're picking. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? He said, when he saw Him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What an incredible, you know, what an incredible announcement. What an incredible, you know, recognition that one man was born into the human race whose mission on the planet was to take the sin of every single person, past, present and future, to carry it, to defeat the power of it and to defeat the devil and break his ability to accuse us, to set the planet free. My goodness. One individual at a time, whoever believes, whoever believes, whoever believes. It was not a political move. See, they came in recognizing him as their king, but he wasn't coming in to be king at that point. He was coming in to be the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. So that's the tenth. But do you know that that particular day had been prophesied 483 years before that, 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 that he was going to turn up at that time? There's a prophecy in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, where the angel Gabriel, who's the same angel who told Mary she was going to get pregnant, with the Messiah, the angel Gabriel, and I won't read it now because it'll take too long to go there, but the angel Gabriel turns up to Daniel. Daniel goes, now, 
We're in big trouble. He's praying. He's going, now just get this. Daniel is in exile. He's in Babylon. He's in Iraq. And he's going, we're in a real pickle here, God. We've lost our land. We're in exile. We turned to idolatry. The reason we're here, it, it was discipline. We've lost our land. We've lost our city of Jerusalem. We've lost our temple. We're here. Can we please go back now? And the prophet Jeremiah had prophesied already that they were only going to be at, they were going to be gone for 70 years. So he goes, it's about that time now, God, can we go back? But the angel Gabriel comes to him and goes, well, yeah, we, we've got that sorted. But I want to tell you something even more important. And that is that in 469 times 7, 483 years to the day, I'm telling you when Messiah is going to turn up. Yep. And it's written there and to the exact day, this day. The 10th of Nisan, the Sunday that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. You know, prior to that day, people had said to him, come on, his own family had said, why don't you go and show the people who you are? Declare yourself the King, the Saviour, the Messiah. And he'd go, no, no, not yet. My time's not yet. He kept telling them, my time's not yet. My time's not yet. But this day that he rode into Jerusalem, he goes, this is the day. Yeah. Incredible, isn't it? That had been written 600 years before and he turns up on the exact day that it was supposed to be. And, and read this, we're going to go to the next frame. And, and it says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day, this day, what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when, when your enemies will build an embankment against you. That's what I was talking about when the Romans came. The days will come. They'll build an embankment against you. They'll encircle you, hem you in on every side. They'll dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Isn't that radical? Yeah. He goes, guys, this was the day you should have made the right decision. Do you realize that God has pivotal moments when he's calling people? Uh, there's no doubt if you're a believer today, there was probably a pivotal moment when God was calling you, he was drawing you, and it was really critical that you said, yes, I believe. Because who's to say that he'll ever call you again? Because no one comes unless the Father draws. So I believe that God draws people and, and, he's, and he's probably drawing people right now from right around us. Some of your family members, he's drawing them. But we make a choice. And, and the Jewish leadership made a choice. He goes, today was the day. It really mattered today. Up till now, I was trying to get you ready to make the right decision, but you didn't make it. And you would have had peace, but instead of peace, you're going to be wiped out. You're going to be surrounded by armies and decimated. And it happened in 70 AD, exactly as Jesus said it was going to happen. It happened that way and um, they, they didn't recognize. Jesus, you know, God does things in time and he expects us to be aware of what he's doing in that time. He expects us. Jesus said, can you not discern the signs of the times? Don't you realize what's going on right now? So it was a very critical day that they, that they recognized that. Anyway, they didn't, and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of history. I can give it to you. It's, it's, it's both secular and biblical history. But I want to look with you just for a moment. What happened to Jesus in that last week? Because that's the week where we're celebrating. And it's really important that you, you get the history of it as to why we're doing it, right? Because Christians, we know Easter is not about bunny rabbits and chocolate eggs. I'm not saying you can't eat chocolate eggs, Pastor Steve. I'm sure you'll be happy to have a, a nice chocolate bunny or, you know, Fredo frog or something. But, you know, this is why Christians recognize Easter because of what actually happened at this time in history. It's still relevant today. So if Sunday was Nisan 10, Leviticus tells us that Nisan 14 is the Passover. Now, this prophecy that went, came to Daniel, he said, after that day, Messiah will be killed and left with nothing. So what happened was four days later would be, what, Thursday, wouldn't it? 
But when would that Thursday have started? The night before sundown. Because Jewish. The Jewish day didn't, you know, it didn't, it didn't start at midnight. It started at 6 o'clock. You know why? Because God's going, I want you to start with rest and then work. Don't work yourself silly so you're dying and then you have to rest. I want you to live your life resting, then working. So that's how he planned it. That's how he made the world, the evening first, then the morning. And that's the Jewish day. So, so as soon as the sun went down, what was Jesus doing? On Wednesday night, he was celebrating the Passover with his disciples in the upper room. And, and he instituted something called what? Communion. As a way of remembering that he, you know, I think the biggest thing about communion is, one, it, it celebrated on Passover. The original Passover was when the Jews were in Egypt as slaves and God said to them, I'm going to get you out of here. I don't want you to be slaves. You're my kids. So he said, what I want you to do is kill a lamb, share it as a family, eat it and put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. The angel of death is coming through. But when it sees the blood covering your house, you won't be touched. But all the oldest children in all the other Egyptian houses, no blood covering them, they, they lost their oldest child. It was a way of God saying, you better let my people go because it's going to cost you if you don't. And it hurt them bad, but they had plenty of previous opportunities before that. So nevertheless, the point being, they're recognizing that historical thing, but now that the lamb of the original Passover was just symbolic of the true lamb who was present on that day celebrating the Passover feast with his disciples on Wednesday evening, which was Passover. But they came and arrested him that night, didn't they, in the night? And they dragged him down in the middle of the night to before Pilate. They whipped him with the, you know, the cat of nine tails full of steel and bits that tore him to pieces. They, they nailed him to, they made him drag a cross up a hill. And a, by three o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday, which was 9 and 14, Leviticus tells us that's Passover. And we know it was Thursday. That Jesus is bleeding to death and dies and says, Father, you know, receive my spirit. And Father, for, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Right? So he's the high priest. He's, he's going, Lord, don't hold their sin against them. I want, I'm here to save the world from their sin. That's what happened. The, you, the reason it's important to know it happened that way, because there's no way it happened on Friday. Because remember what Jesus said? Uh, I know we celebrate Friday. That's because of some other things. But it's not actually the dates of the Jewish system that Jesus was on. The reason I can tell you, Jesus said, three days and three nights I'll be in the belly of the earth. Three days, three nights. Friday, there's no way you're going to wind up with three days and three nights. But Thursday, there was three days and three nights because part the, the rest of Thursday, Friday, second day, Saturday, third day, and the nights were Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and he resurrected on the first day of the week, Sunday morning. Didn't he? So he fulfilled that. But there's another prophecy that's kind of weird that couldn't really fit with that, if, though, if that's true. But where he said, on the third day, I will rise again. So how does that work? If he's three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, how does he rise again on the third day? Well, he does. Because the third day, the first day after he died, because he died on a Thursday, the first day after he died was Friday. The third, second day after he died was Saturday. And the third day was Sunday morning when he did rise from the dead. So both are true. You see... If you just read it for what it is, you'd think it's a conundrum. There must be, it's a mix-up, it's not true. It's, it, but it is, and it fits. And the Thursday was nice and 14. But do you know the Friday was also a Sabbath day? You can read it in Leviticus 26. It says the 15th of Nisan is a Sabbath, a special Sabbath. In fact, John records it, and he goes, actually, the next day was a special Sabbath. Not normal Sabbath, not normal Saturday Sabbath, but a special Sabbath. In other words, there were two Sabbaths. 
no, no, I wasn't. I was mad at the other two. Two is we be Safa, a Safa, a Sajik, a Basova on the Friday. Yeah. Yes, they do Friday night. Friday it's night sundown. Yes, but that's not what I'm saying here. So we'll talk about it after, if you don't mind. So the Friday was a special Sabbath. It's the 15th of Nisan. And then the Saturday, of course, was a Sabbath. In fact, Matthew 28 says, after the Sabbaths, plural, after the Sabbaths, Jesus rose from the dead on the Sunday morning. So I'm just telling you, there's a history to this that's rock solid. It's in the Bible. You can tell what happened and that Jesus rose from the dead. And your faith is confident in that promise. So what I want to say this to you is because if you know that Jesus fulfilled the time plan of heaven when he came to save us from our sin... He's perfectly figured out when to come back because he has promised to return. Do you know every time you take communion, you take the juice, you remember the blood of Jesus paid for your sin, you eat the, you eat the wafer, the bread. He said, this is my body, take, eat, remember me. Well, he's not a fable. There's a physical thing reminding you that he physically came and he physically will return. See, when he said, take the communion, he said, do this as often as you do. Remember that I came and that I'm coming back for you. So he didn't say, just look back. He said, I want you to also look forward because this is my planet and I'm going to get it back. He might have come as a savior, but he's going to come again as the true king. He's the king of kings. It's rightful that he reign on the earth to bring the wrongs to right, to bring a suffering to bring suffering to an end, to wipe away every tear. There are so many promises that are not yet fulfilled. Where where even nature itself, the Bible says, the lion will lie down next to the lamb. There's going to be friendship even in nature. When the king reigns, he puts the wrongs to right. Even in nature, the Bible tells us that all of nature right now is groaning, wanting. The revealing of the sons of God because the rightful rulers of the earth will ultimately be you and I. Because we're the restored original plan, except that's not just to Adam and Eve, it's all of us as well because of Jesus. Are you with me? And the snake that they should have ate, that should have got rid of in the beginning is going to be locked up for a thousand years. No longer to cause all the, the, the hell that is going on on the planet today. All I'm saying is the Lord has promised to come and I could talk to you a lot more about that and, and, and amazing things that are happening in the world that indicate His coming might be very soon. But I just, I just want to encourage you with this, that He has promised to come. And one of the most wonderful promises that you can read uh, is, is right here. And it's in um, the book of John, chapter 14. Jesus says this, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it wasn't so, I would have told you that. I would have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. So where is he? He's with the Father. He's with the Father. Where are we going to be with him? With the Father. Do you know that these words are the words that a groom would use when he's picked out his girl? And she obviously had to say yes. Do you know, in, in, in Jewish culture, what would happen is, I guess quite often the family would organize it. Um, so because, because it would join the community, it would join the families together. The son marries their daughter. And, and so I don't know how much choice they got in the matter. Maybe they got a lot of choice. Maybe they had no, no choice. But they were betrothed. So he's marrying her. So what he would do is he would come to her and say, Girl, I'm going to my dad's house and I'm going to build a really nice place for it. us. We're going to add it on. Because everybody lived where their inheritance was. 
where their land was. So, so they actually had a plot of ground that their family owned. And so you couldn't just go and get a flat somewhere. You, you, lived, you lived where one of your families was and it was, usually, it was the father. The guy would, would go and he'd go, listen, girl, I'll be back for you, but I'm, I've got to go and build this place. And, and when I've got it ready, I'm going to make it as good as I can. Tell me what you like. I'm going to, I'm going to set it all up and then I'm going to come back. And th how they would do it is they'd blow trumpets. They'd come into town. They'd blow trumpets. The girl would hear the, the, the trumpets blasting and she'd go, oh, I better put my lovely dress on. Oh, I better do my makeup. Oh, I better have a I better quickly have a shower. You know, we're getting married now. So he'd turn up with his friends and they'd say, Come on, girl, come on. And, and, and she'd come down and you know, all the wolf whistles and everybody shouting and yelling and, and they're beating their drums and blowing their this it's a celebration. But she's getting out of there to go to his father's house. And you know what they would do? They would spend seven days celebrating each other. Um, in a really nice, intimate way, hidden away for seven days away from everybody else. That's how they, I think it's a good way to start a married life. <laughs> Consummating the marriage, seven days hidden away. And only after that, they'd come out and have a ceremony called the wedding feast. Because they're already acquainted. They're all, that you know, they're love struck. And so they're going to come out, but they're, they're you know, they're not, they're just happy to be meeting the family now because they've had seven days of great happiness, hopefully. And this is the picture of the Lord's return. He's saying, who's he coming for? His bride. What's he going to do? He's going to take us to be with him in his father's house where he is. And at the end of it, what does it say at the end of the book of Revelation? Is a big wedding feast. So, get ready. It's only going to happen to one generation that he returns. Only one generation were there when he came to walk on the earth as a man. And only one generation, we don't know which one, but my, my book, and if I got to talk to you more about this stuff, I'd say it could be us. So it's not to be afraid of, it's to be excited about. It's to be, that's the hope. It doesn't matter what goes on in the world, however bad or messy it might get. The fact is Jesus has promised he's taking us. He wants us and he's got it sorted. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we just thank you that you love us, that you're with us, that you're for us. And that no matter what we face in life, you're with us. So Lord, I just pray that this morning, the reality of your coming, the reality that you fulfilled each, you know, historical date on the very day, meant that God, you've seen into time, you've seen into our lives. You know, you know where to meet us, you know what our time of need is God you're always right on time maybe not our time but you you know so Lord today I just pray that if there are people here this morning that you're calling to come home that this would be their day for for finding your peace for finding that that moment to turn their lives around because they've come home to you. So if that's you today and you want to come home and you want Jesus to be your savior today, I want you to put your hand up. Just put it up and say, look, I'm, I really want to come. That's so great. I want to get right with God. That's awesome, you guys. We're so glad you put your hand down, but that's awesome, man. Jesus, he's the answer. He's gonna be the answer in your life. It's so, so great. So if you raise your hand, just look at me for a second. You meant it, didn't you? I know you did. God loves you. And you meant that up there, didn't you, man? I know you did. And did you mean that? You really want to follow Jesus? Give him your life, right? So just, I want you to stand up and just come down here and meet me. And I'm going to say a prayer with you. While other people are praying, you know, I just, would you come down? Listen, come on, man. Just come on. That's cool. Good to see you, man. What's your name? Shannon. Sorry? Shannon. Shannon, good. Shannon? Christine. Christine? And? Corey. Corey. We're going to say a prayer, all right?
and I want you to say what I say right after I do, right? So we're going to go, just close your eyes. Father God, Father God I believe you love me. I believe you, love me. I believe you sent Jesus, I believe you sent Jesus to, pay all my to pay for all my wrongs. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Be my saviour savior. and come into my life today. I surrender to you. Amen. That's so cool. I'm so glad for you, Christine. Glad for you, Shannon. Glad for you, man. What was your name? Corey. Corey. Yeah. Corey. Thank you. Very cool. We're stoked for these guys, man. Stoked. Before we move on, Christine, I want to encourage you that, you know, you, I believe the Lord wants you to know how special you are to Him, that you're loved. Sometimes our worst enemy is ourself. Sometimes we beat up on ourselves, you know. I just feel like God's saying to you, from today on, can that just stop? Can, can He wants to show you His kindness, how good He is, how kind He is. And if you will agree with him that you are chosen by him and, and loved, it's going to change a lot of stuff. Okay? Is it true? Yes. It's true, hey? Corey, God's been after you for quite a long time. And he's got, an, he's got a tremendous plan for your life, man. Things are going to turn around. Some things that you've wanted to change for a while haven't changed. But the more that you surrender to Jesus, the more you're going to see just miracles. Things that you know it was God who did it. Because he, He's there to be your friend, right? So, yeah, very powerful. Are you guys friends? I feel like that's a good friendship. Just, you guys need to look out for each other. Yeah, you're going to help each other, you know? It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. We need each other, man. Shannon? Good on you, man. Proud of you. Some people are going to be standing in heaven, laughing their heads off. And people are going to go, well, that's not fair. How come they're here? They didn't do everything right in their lives. And they're going to be like, it's going to be like you, man. You're going to be laughing. So, so, so glad and so happy. And you're going to know, man, it's only because God's good. And there's going to be other people who maybe won't make it even, who haven't made half the mistakes. But it's all about Jesus. You know, you made the best decision you could ever make today. And we're for you, man. We're totally for you. It's so powerful. All right, then. Well, I don't know what else. Just let's finish. So God bless you. Maybe when you get to those days this week, just remember that it's in the Bible. You can look it up in the Bible. If you want to know where to find some of those things, um, you can come ask me or Pastor uh, Steve, you know. But there's definitely in there. So, yeah. But look, there's no point getting mad at people for celebrating Good Friday when, when obviously it wasn't. You know, just don't worry about it. Just celebrate it as if that was the Passover when Jesus died. I mean... You know, it's not worth fighting over. I just want you to know what the scriptures teach so that you've got a confidence that, you know, there's nothing that doesn't fit with itself, so to speak. Praise the Lord. Amen. What a good God.